All right. I'm going to start by opening up my Bible so you know that it's sound doctrine. There we go. We got one left. We're good. <laughs> All right. Jesus, we worship you. We love you. We praise you. There's nobody like you. There's no one above you or beside you. God, we worship you. God, we thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you speak today and that our, art, our hearts are open to receive your word, God. God, I just thank you that we get the opportunity to meet together. I thank you, God, for the opportunity to worship you corporately. <laughs> I was just about to say how beautiful, I was just about to tell God how beautiful it is that we get to worship him, but he says you have no idea how beautiful it is when you worship me. So as much beauty as we see, he sees even more, and he finds more value in it. So God, I just thank you that we get to feel that value too, God. May we never lose sight of why we do it, God. That it's not just going through the motions and saying the words, God, but it is attaching our heart to it and feeling it, God. We love you. We love you and we worship you and we thank you for the opportunity just to get to worship you, just to be in your presence, just to get to, just to, get to walk with you, just to get to the opportunity to walk closely with you, God. God, and if we're not walking closely with you, help us identify areas in our life where we're not, where we fail you, God. You never fail us, God. God, help us raise the standard of our life, God, to walk in pureness and holiness, God. God, may you be the big rock priority in our life. May you be <laughs> everything. Amen. I guess I'll just start by crying already. Why not? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start with worship, and how dare you guys start with champion. I mean, it's like every time... At least it didn't end with champion. That would have been that would have been worse for me. <laughs> I love that champion song. Um, when I wrote in my notes, how dare you guys? Um, I love it. Says I am who you say I am. <laughs> do we believe that? Right? Because we have like a lot of opinions of ourselves, but do we believe that he that we are who he says we are? So if you're ever feeling down about yourself, actually, if you're even feeling good about yourself, um, God say, God, who am I? Who, who do you say I am? And um, yeah, we were, I was just talking to my wife and um, like when I married her, I was 135 pounds and she was, uh, she was like hitting on me or whatever. She was like, ooh, you look good today. And I was just like, Ugh, I look better like nine years ago. And then she was like, no, like she, she was just ex expressing um, her love for me. And I didn't see myself in that light because I still saw my, you know, 135 pound nine years ago self. And then I look at myself now and I'm like, ugh, I'm getting older, I'm getting bigger, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So like my, my self-esteem wasn't exactly too high, but then my wife says, whoo, baby. And it's just like, whoa, but I am who you say I am. You know what I mean? And um, there's sometimes in life where we, we don't have that person that will like regularly tell you like, you're doing good. You're looking good. I like what you're doing, but you do have that person. He's God, right? So sometimes we look for that validation out of our partner or out of our friends or out of our, our people, out of our church people, but at the end of the day, that validation has to come from God. Otherwise, there's going to be a time where you're alone and disappointed, and that's going to be overwhelming, but hopefully you turn to the, <laughs> to the one who can tell you who you are when you're not feeling like who you are. Because sometimes when I wake up in the morning, like this morning I was telling Rod, I woke up and I just felt just so yuck. I felt like, I felt like 10 years ago me waking up like hungover and groggy and just like barely able to just get out of bed. And I was just like, what in the world is going on? It's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm preaching today. Yeah, why not? <laughs> so like we said before, when you squeeze an apple, you get apple juice. You squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. When you squeeze a Christian, you get Jesus. So the devil was the devil was squeezing me today, but I let I let Jesus come out of me because when you squeeze me, I recognize it and I know what's going on, and now I can stop what's going on because I am who He says I am. I know who I am, and I can stop that. I can shut it down, and then pretty soon He's not going to want to squeeze you in that avenue anymore because He says, "Oh, He knows what I'm doing. Try to do a different tactic." 
he's not that smart. So he, he'll always, just like today, I'm, I'm going to preach and he's going to squeeze me. Well, come on. Like I told Rod, Rod told me one time, tell the devil to give it your best shot. And then he's done, right? Kind of, that kind of scared me a little bit. I was like, Ooh. oh, oh, wait. He's already fought my battle. He's already won that war. I go when he says I go. Because he's my champion. And then it's, um, it's, it's just, uh, I am who you say I am. And then it says, he has crowned you with confidence. Can you believe that? There is a crown on your head, and it's confidence. And you're not going to know who you are, and you're not going to believe who you are, unless you know that you have that confidence, that he gave you that confidence, just because he knew that you would second-guess yourself and second-guess what he said. But no, he gives you confidence. And the closer you walk with him, the more confidence you gain. And the more you can hear his voice and the more you can believe what he's saying about you and hold it as truth. So if you, if you don't believe you are who he says you are, get with him. He'll help you believe it because he'll start to give you that confidence. Because when you know, my wife was, was giving me good words, I just didn't have that confidence. But, but that gave me confidence, right? Because I'm just like, you know what? I am. You know, I am. And you, know, you, you, should, like, you should like the way you talk. You should like the way you look. You should like the way you feel, right? And if you don't, then get aside with God and say, why don't I like the way I look? Why don't I like the way I feel? Why do I not like the things that I say? And that's when sanctification is starting to grab a hold of your heart and teach you and grow you and mold you and push you. And, and God is like, hey, there's more for your life. There's better for your life. And this is where we're going to put you. And it may seem difficult right now, but if you could see what I see, you, knew, you know it won't be difficult. And that's when we're going through things in life and God is stretching us and expanding us. We just got to know I am who you say I am. And I know that you're, you're putting me through this or pushing me, pushing me through this to get to something better. And if we could just see that something better, this would be nothing, right? And I'm going to tell you right now, that something better is an eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the lover of your soul. He calls you bride. Come on. I mean, it's there, right? You feel down on yourself. Think of what's to come. Think, think further. Look further because he's already there saying, come on. I've already fought that battle. Don't, no, don't worry about it. Just step over that one. But he doesn't even have a head. I slayed it. It's here. See? Oh, that's easier. Come on. And then I have back to life, born again, heart set free. Um, this is what happens um, when you're born again. When you're born again, your heart is set free. If you don't feel like your heart is free, then why? Like what's going on in your life? If you've been born again and you, d you don't feel like your heart is set free, it's because the devil stole that word from you. He stole what happened in your life for, to be set free. So God said, here it is. Jesus went and he got the keys. He opened the gate. He opened the door and he said, I am the doorway. Come to me. So you must step out of your prison cell. And then some of us go and step back into that prison cell and halfway shut the door and say, I don't know what's going on with my life. I don't feel free because you got yourself back in the prison cell. He's our, the door is unlocked, guys. It, right? He has the keys. He's unlocked the door. You've just shut it, right? So if we feel like we're trapped and bent up and, you know, it's really easy to feel that way and feel, feel trapped in life, that door is unlocked, okay? It's, it's a prison cell. It's a facade that we put ourselves in and that the devil tricks you to be in. It's like a mirage. And if you could just see past it and open that gate, you're not in a prison cell, okay? You're in a house, a home for him. God. Every room, remember that sermon? Every room is his. Whew. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Man, God's so good, guys. And then the Living Hope song, I have, to, I have to touch on this one too. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such bod boundless grace? So that, that gets me to thinking, like, who could imagine so great a mercy? Because sometimes we have a really, really hard time accepting his grace and his mercy because we have this idea about ourselves right and that idea 
is you know it's this that, that devil's idea that says geez man you've been through a lot you think god's going to forgive you again after all you've done haven't you done this again haven't you been born again and your heart set free and you put yourself back in prison you think he wants to hear that again from you yes he does want to hear that again from you right we have to grab a hold of that grace is there for you it, he doesn't take it away it's for you it says, who could fathom such boundless grace? It's just because we're humans and it's hard to understand that somebody would feel this way about us and do this for us. And we just need to accept it because it's there. Strike it out of your mind right now. Who could? No, God has boundless grace and mercy for you. And he does, and that's true. The God, oh man, this makes me just want to break down and cry. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Woo. How many people of us are, how many people of us, how many of us people are, are walking around still wearing our sin, right? Last, last month I preached about sin consciousness and, and walking around and just being so conscious of your sin that you just, you're, you're, you're heavenly useless, right? And the, the shame that comes with it, right? If you have guilt, shame, it's, it's not from the Lord. If you're feeling guilty and shameful, steal yourself away and say, God, I feel guilty. God, I feel shameful, but you don't make me to feel that way. Why do I feel this way? God, forgive me. You know, the repentance isn't uh, seeing how much you can cry or seeing how low you can get to the ground and seeing how many times you can say sorry or seeing how many times you can sincerely say sorry. It takes a turning of your face to his and saying, I love you, Lord. Forgive me. Done. Can you believe that? Done. He doesn't say, okay, but remember last time, and then that time before. No, he says, my, he said, my son, I love you. Thank you. Because you, you, when you look in his direction, you ravish his heart. He's like, ooh, you're looking at me? I'm like, yeah, I don't know how many times I say it, but it was, it was just so real to me when I read that Bible verse. When I glance in his direction, I ravish his heart. I have the ability to do that, you know? Okay. To wear my sin and bear my shame, the cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The king of kings calls me his own. Beautiful savior, I am yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Come on. That is just unbelievable, guys. I love it. So... And I know I start this way every single time, but people, you guys got to know there's, there's more to worship, right? There's, there's so, such deep worship in these words, and he gave us the ability to, to just to break these down and to think about him, because somebody wrote that, right? And it's, it's awesome. And what they wrote isn't necessarily like what I'm taking away from it, because there's, there's deeper levels, and he talks to us differently and we have different ideas and stuff like that. So like what I get out of worship, you guys get out of worship too, but there's just amazing things that you guys think about during worship. And, um, and worship, really just try to focus your, your heart and your everything. Like I tell people, there's a big whiteboard out there. And before I get into worship, I have um, my company, my problems, my this going on and that going on. I got to build a dog kennel, my trampoline blew away. And there's like this, all these things, right? And before I get into worship, I close my eyes and I say, Jesus, I love you, I worship you. And then I imagine that whiteboard and I just wipe it clean. Because none of that stuff I want to bring into worship. Because I want to worship with my whole heart, right? I want to worship abandoned for him, right? An audience of one is how I want to worship. And if we can attach our heart to that and we can just wipe out everything else, worship is going to be a lot deeper and a lot more impactful and um, it won't just be, you know, three songs until the announcements and sermon. Um, it'll be, we're done. That's it. That's that. Just wow, you know. So I just really, really encourage and challenge you guys to, to just. There's more. There's more there, right? To just to draw in because he's he's, give, he's given us the fullness and he's given us the access. It's just like a bank account. We have the routing number. We have the PIN number. We just need to learn how to draw from that bank account and receive it, right? All right. Should I start preaching now? <laughs> All right, I'm going to be in Hebrews again. 
Um, it's the last chapter in 13. Um, it won't be too terribly long because we've we've kind of we've kind of ran through some of this stuff. But in in my heart, I can't uh, leave Hebrews unfinished because uh, 13 is just it's the the icing on the cake. It's it. It's the the, the topping. All right. So Hebrews 13. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna jump right into it. After I get a drink of water. I think next time I won't even plan a sermon. I'll just just, just speak off the worship and <laughs> just let it go that way. All right, 13. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. All right. Whew. I, this is this is what I, I love about this part. Um, it says, "Keep on." All right, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. I guess kind of weird for for me. Me and my brothers have a rougher relationship. Where I don't think you guys want me to love you like I love my brothers. I don't know. <laughs> um, but what what really stood out for me on this one is the keep on. Right, keep on. Remember what I said? Uh, like I think last month I was like, loving people is hard. Like, we're, we're good at it. You know, we're supposed to love God and love people, but sometimes loving people is so dang hard. And God knows that. That's why he said right here, keep on. It's like, it's so emotion, right? It's not like a, well, love each other until it's hard and then uh, cut it off, right? No, it says, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality. And that's a... Uh, that's where I, I've even said this before, but that's where I'm trying to I- expand uh, my horizons. Because, uh, like, like I said before, like my house is mine, and I like my space, and I'm, I've never really been one on inviting people over and all this kind of stuff. Um, my wife, on the other hand, absolutely loves to do it, and I don't. And I know what the Bible's saying right here, and I know where my heart is on the issue, and I'm saying, God help me. And He has in the past year. I've I've had a bunch of people out to my house. I've had, like I, you guys heard before, but I've nearly had all, every single one of my family members visit me. And I was telling God how that never happens. And now I've opened up my, my house for multiple weeks for people. And, um, you know, we took on a friend as well. And that was just, just cool when, when God reveals something in your heart and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to work on that, God. And he's like, good. And all this good stuff comes out of it, right? There's good relationship. There's good fellowship. Uh, there's learning. There's growing. So open your house, guys. Even though it's tough. Some people, it's not tough. All right. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. So remember, um, when they were doing Hebrews, um, when he was giving this message, it was, it was two former Jews that converted over to Christianity. So, um, you know, a lot of them were getting really persecuted, and some of them were in prison, and there was just a lot of bad stuff happening. And he's saying, hey, remember those guys as if it was you there. Um, because guess what? Being persecuted for your faith, it could very easily be you, Right? Or it couldn't, just depending on where you're at with the Lord, right? Somebody, somebody asks you, you know, whatever, is Jesus yours? If, if you say yes, I'm going to kill you. Yes, all day long, right? If anything, they gave you a promotion in heaven, really. <laughs> die, die a martyr's death or something. But he's saying this, too, to, um, to help us on a compassion level, Right? Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Because it's so easy to, to, to look at somebody and be like, oh man, um, like a, a, she's preaching the gospel at school and now has no friends or something like that. Like, where, where do we relate with somebody like that? Because there are brothers and our sisters and maybe we're the ones to come alongside them and love them and help them out. Number four, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Woo! There's a huge attack on marriage. 
huge attack on marriage and um, a big skew on what people think marriage looks like nowadays. I mean, it's, uh, I don't even want to give all the examples, but it's just, it's welcome to 2023, folks. It's, it's twisted out there. Um, you must, <laughs> I, I must love my wife the way Jesus loved the church, okay? And then she will honor me, right? So nowadays it gets really twisted because it's like, well, she doesn't honor me, so I'm not going to love her like Jesus loves the church. And then the wife is saying, well, he doesn't love me like Jesus loves the church, so I'm just not going to honor him. And then pretty soon you guys, like, where, where, how, that, how miserable it must be to be together in your own house, in your own skin, with each other, right? And then there's a, there's a big attack out there on this is okay and that's okay. And, um, you know, like, I don't, I, don't, I don't go and not cheat on my wife um, because it's the wrong thing to do. I don't cheat on my wife because I love her, right? And there's, there's a love and a relationship that gets built up in marriage and it comes with honesty and, and trials. And there's a lot to it. I'm trying to, trying to think about how I want to say it. I'll just move on. Marriage is holy, guys. Honor it. All right. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will not fear. What can mere people do to me? Ooh. And then in my notes, I have, uh, be satisfied with your season. His teaching is growing you. Are you a good steward of what you have? Do you truly believe what he has for your life, for your financial life? And then what is he teaching you about money? So when you're, when you're going through um, financial times, um, you know, because sometimes there's financial times where you don't have that much money, and then there's financial times where you have an overabundance of money. And one of them kind of sucks to be in, <laughs> the one with not too much money. Um, but I've been through, and we've all been, we've, and I'm just kind of like looking back through my life, but I've been through um, several seasons where I didn't have very much money and um, having to, to trust God for the next and for the next and for the next. And then um, pretty soon I have enough money and then all of a sudden I stop trusting God, right? And then I start, I start going in on my own confidence and my job and how much money that makes me. And then all of a sudden that's my focus and I've, my focus is, has come off of the one who has provided for me and who has provided this for me. So sometimes there's, you know, there, it, this isn't just a battle of, um, well, if you're really poor, uh, don't, don't shoot out and run for money with all your heart, but like, where are you stewarding your season that you're in right now? Um, can you see the season you're in right now? Or do you say, or do you chase that like money goal? Like, okay, I'll be happy if we have $40,000 in our bank account and my cell phone's paid three months in advance, right? Is that the kind of stuff that makes you happy? It, it makes you feel secure, but he gives you the avenue to, to do that, right? So what I'm trying to say is, even if you're in a season of abundance and then you're in a season of, uh, of not very much, are you trusting the Lord in both, right? And then if, you're, if you are in a season of abundance, are you, are you loving your money more than you're loving the Lord? Are you loving your money more than you're loving people, right? Because, is that more money, more problems? But like, money causes a lot of problems. And I've, I've seen it, I've seen it twist like really good friends, right? And I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe I don't have that level of money to where it changes people or whatever, but um, there's a very real thing that happens when money's involved and it's sick. It's gross. Number seven. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all of the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. And I'm just thinking about um, a pastor named Jeff Mann who was really just a huge staple in my life. Um, somebody that would call me on the regular and, and meet with me and and care about me and then he would he would also honor me and he would love me and he would respect me and i would 
I would see his life and how he treated his wife and his, how his kids and his family and um, the way he treated strangers and stuff like that. And, and it made me, like, in, a, in essence, want to be like him, right? But he wasn't, he wasn't being Jeff. He was being like Jesus because that's, that's who he was called to be like. That's who we are called to be like. So when, when, we're, when we're helping people and we're mentoring people, um, we need to be Christ-like, you know? We need, when we're loving them, it has to come out of a place of relationship with Jesus. Because if, if you're teaching people, you're on a pedestal and you're out in public and then there's like this, this judging and this criticism that can come down on your life and you have to be the same guy and the same person you are on Sunday as you are on Monday, right? And Tuesday and Wednesday. Like to be just a different guy on Sunday is just thick, right? And that doesn't honor and it does not please God. Um, and if you feel like you're a different person at church than you are on Tuesday at your work, Come on, man. God's bringing that up in your heart right now. It's okay. It's okay if you don't feel that way right now. If you don't feel the same way you do on Monday as you do on Sunday, it's okay. Because now God's giving you that realization that you don't feel that way, right? That's step one. I, I don't feel like I do on Sunday. I don't feel like that person when I go and uh, talk to this guy that I worked with, right? So that's just step one. It's not to make you feel bad and it's like, oh, how come you're not the same guy you are on Sunday? What is this all about? He's saying, hey, what's going on here? Because he's full of grace and he's full of mercy. And he says, you are the same person you are on Sunday because who you are on Sunday, that's who you are, right? So let's be that person on Monday. Let's be that person on Tuesday. Jesus Christ is the same. Ooh, this is, out of all of them, this is, this is really cake. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You guys believe that? <laughs> it's so good. Okay, your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food, which do not help those who follow them. We have an altar from which the priest and the tabernacle have no right to eat. Under the old system, the high priest brought the blood of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin, and the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. And we talked about this a little bit on the other, on the other messages. So, and this is where it ties it all together. I love it. I love how this is where the, the Old Testament points to Jesus, and then it's all tied in. Like, it just... Ah, it's perfect. So also, Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Man, oh man. I love uh, verse 13. Um, it says, so let us go out to him. Um, and that just like super burned into my heart when I read it. Because um, it, it sounds like there's a going, right? Let us go out to him. So, you know, God meets you where you're at, but sometimes he says, hey, where you're at is not good. Come to me. And he's continually saying, come to me, come to me. Every day, every night, and, you're, and you lay in your bed and you pull out your phone or whatever you do, um, you know, in the morning he just says, he says, come to me, come to me, spend time with me. I love you, I've been waiting for you to wake up. You're awake now. Let's go, Jesse, let's be together. So, so a going is a huge part. And then it let us go. Um, for this world is not our permanent home. And I, I said that when we started the message. We are going somewhere else. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, pro proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Throughout the day, um, it's so much fun to turn your face to him. And um, just randomly when you feel it in your heart, Jesus worship you. I love you. 
There's nobody like you. Take time to dote on him, right? Take time to love him. Throughout your day, take time to turn your face in his direction and ravish his heart. You can do that anytime you want to. Anytime you feel like the devil's squeezing you and Jesus is supposed to come out, right, and it doesn't, pull yourself aside. Jesus, I worship you. I love you. I can just say that over and over again, and that's how it gets me into it, because because I'm attaching my heart to it. It's not just a something I say. It's a something I feel, and it's a something I live. I worship you, Jesus. I love you. Let me worship you with the way that I speak, with the way I interact with people, God. Let me worship you with the way that I work, right? Let me worship you with the way I do dishes, <laughs> right? I remember I was a stay-at-home dad, and... Um, we were talking, and I was, I was, we were in a group of people, and at a, a church function, I was just like, I'm just a stay-at-home dad. It's like, I find it, find it hard to make, like, a real difference in the world or something like that. You know, my kids are at school or whatever, and this mom, I think her name is Winter, um, she said, uh, you do dishes? Yeah, that's worship, Jesse. You do, do you do laundry? Yeah, that's worship, Jesse. And I was like, how so? She's like, how, well, how do you do it? Are you worshiping the Lord while you're doing it? You know, like you're supposed to, you're supposed to work unto the Lord, right? And my job was dishes, vacuuming, laundry, breakfast, and stuff like that. And then I was getting all down in my life because I didn't, you know, didn't feel like a man. <laughs> I didn't even like coffee. I don't even eat bacon. I didn't even, I'm going through a real crisis. <laughs> I don't like coffee. I came to that realization that coffee is just not for me, and I only drank it to feel like a man and look like a man and all that kind of stuff. And I just had came to terms and it was just a stay-at-home dad and I really don't like coffee and I don't even like the way caffeine makes me feel and everybody says I want all the bacon and I'm like yeah, bacon's good but just give me like a piece or something it's like super greasy and it tears up my body and all that I love I love pigs though the pigs are good I like hamburgers <laughs> ground pork but I just, I just came to realizations that that's just not who I am right and um, as I was a stay-at-home dad, I was just, I can, I can worship the Lord because it's, it's holy. I'm providing clean dishes for my family. And he's like, aren't you excited about that? They're just dishes. Yeah, but I, you got them. And they're clean. And you got hot water. And you got soap. And guess what? You're cleaning your dishes because you have food to cook later. Isn't that awesome? Look at that. Your washer works in your dryer. So you're going to have all these clean clothes instead of the huge pile. I got my... Laundry's never ending at my house. I feel like I could have two washers and two dryers, and we'd still never catch up. And then even if, uh, you know, kids, it's your responsibility to start, you know, washing your own clothes. We only got one washer. Washer's always busy. I don't think two washers and dryers is I think just, God's like, just get used to it. You got, you got six kids. You're never running out of laundry. And then, uh, and then someday the laundry's not going to be there. That's going to be sad. <laughs> my oldest is 13 and I'm already sad about him leaving that's funny <laughs> but I saw that thing one time when your house is messy uh, like don't get bent out of shape about it you know there's fingerprints on the windows and marker on the wall someday there's not going to be fingerprints on those windows someday there's not going to be marker on that wall unless you have six kids and they're all girls and you'll have 20-something grandchildren, then okay. Because <laughs> me and my wife were, sorry, me and my wife were not talking about having another kid. She was talking about having another kid. <laughs> and um, I'm like, come on, man, we're almost out of diapers. We've been in diapers for like 13 years almost. It's just like a continual never-ending thing. And I'm like, bro, we're almost done with diapers. And I'm like, once they graduate, we can, we can go we can do what we want. And she's like, we do what we want anyways. And I'm like, that's true, but uh, we'll, we'll just have no kids. And then she was like, we're going to be grandparents in like, you know, less than 10 years. <laughs> and my kids aren't going to be growing and out by 10 years. So um, when I told God from a very young age, I always want to be a dad. I want to be a good dad. He didn't fail. <laughs> He's so good, though. Not even though. Why do I have to say though? He's so good, though. There's nothing, <laughs> though, about what I said. Ah, you're so good, God. All right, where am I? Therefore, I think I'm on 15. Therefore, let us... Oh, no, I already did that. Oh, 
can't stop though. Let us off, <laughs> let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God. Um, and then when it's talking about sacrifices too, like like when let me read it on further. Sixteen and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Woo! Do you guys see what it said there? Is please God, right? How do we please God? I think it told us right there, right? You want to please God. And then, um, you know, these sacrifices, you know, opening your, opening your home up to somebody is a le- like a legit sacrifice. Like you're, you're, you're sacrificing your time, your energy, your food, your money. You're, you're, you're doing a lot. And like for me, God's like, you're doing a lot, bro. Like big time. Way to go. I'm so proud of you. That person leaves and I'm like, <sighs> God's like, that's my boy. And he's like, you did it, man. One hour and a half of hanging out with somebody at your house. Good job. <laughs> yeah. It's not bad, guys. I'm just, I'm just funny like that. I, I love everybody. I love everybody who comes to my house and visits. But those are sacrifices that please God, right? I love it. I know how to please God. You know, I can look in this direction or have his heart, and I can love people. And, and these sacrifices won't seem like sacrifices after a while. It just seems like this is part of loving people, right? And it won't seem like a sacrifice to you after a while because this is what we do. And this is how we please God. And, and you, if you could know what's actually going on when somebody's at your house or when you go over to somebody's house or, you know, somebody opens your home up and you go and you have a great meal and you get in the car and you look at your wife and you go, that was good. Yes, I love it. We should do stuff like that more often, which is a conversation we never have after somebody leaves my house. She says it, and then I agree with her, I guess. All right. 17 says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them a reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow that would certainly not be for your benefit. And we'll just skip over that one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I love the part where um, their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God, right? So um, there's been people in leadership that have really hurt people before, right? And um, that wasn't God's plan. And I'm going to go over the church hurt thing again. When you run into somebody who's church hurt, you can tell them that, um, you know, I'm sorry that that man hurt you, but that wasn't that wasn't God who hurt you. Um, that man was accountable, is going to be held accountable for what he did, right? So if there's a, a leader out there that's walking around and just hurting people and being arrogant and his character just doesn't really match his position, he's going to be held accountable for it, right? He is. And then I love, uh, give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. Because sometimes when you're in a leadership position and, and stuff is happening and happening and happening, it can just wear on you. And then pretty soon you're just like, why am I even doing this anymore? Um, but for, to, to be in leadership, you got, you got to know why you first started doing it in the first place. And that's why I have saved in my phone is, is a why. Why did I start doing this? And then if I feel down and if I feel worn out and I just feel like I just don't have it anymore, I go back to that why and I relive it with God. Um, and then if, if you have your leaders, um, we're just people, right? Like sometimes leaders get put up on this on this perfect pedestal where they have to just be just all the a hundred percent all the time. I'm just telling you guys, you guys know this too. Like we're just flesh. We're just people. You know, we have our own lives. We have a whole bunch. Like I got six kids and like working with a couple different companies and stuff like that. There's just a lot going on in life. And if I failed any of you guys, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Come alongside me. Let me tell me. <laughs> um, but I just want to. It's, it's just so hard to, um, on being in, in both spots in my life where 
it's it's awful easy to judge and criticize a leadership when you're not making the decisions and and trying to to do the leadership stuff right trying to walk closely with god and say god where do you want this church to be what do you want this to do how do you want me to handle this situation and and you know sometimes the flesh gets intermingled in there and there's sanctification happening where it's, okay i identify that out right so leaders are humans too guys just like everybody else all right pray for us for our conscience pray for us for our conscience is clear and we want to live honorably in everything we do and especially pray that i will soon be able to come back to you soon pray for your leaders guys i know they're praying for you a hundred percent i know they're praying for you give them some protection give them some confidence give them some joy pray for your leaders that they would be strong and they would walk in holiness that they would choose pureness, that they would they would make right decisions, that they would spend quality time with God, that they, they wouldn't just read their Bible because they have to preach on Sunday, right? They would just they would read their Bible to to advance and get a deeper relationship with God, right? That they that they spend time in prayer. Like, come on guys, let's pray for our leaders, right? And I'm gonna end um, with this. I absolutely love um, it's just such a great Great, great blessing. Um, and I'm just going to speak it over our church. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever. Amen. I love that. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. He starts with the gospel on that blessing. It's so good. The great shepherd of the sheep. I just got to read it again. Ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will do you guys want to be equipped with all you need right for doing his will i do gotta receive that may he produce in you i love it how is he gonna it's like how is he gonna produce this in me oh he tells you right there through the power of jesus christ every good thing that is pleasing to him all right uh, i'm gonna pray uh, we, pro we have a, probably a song queued up um, for some ministry time. And, um, man, just take, take, it for what it, take, it, take it for what it is, what, like whatever you got out of this. Um, yeah. That's all I have. I'm going to pray. Jesus, I worship you. I just remember uh, something when I, I, I first started praying and preaching. God said, silence is not awkward. And, um, you know, in your prayer time, I feel like I, like for me, I, I like talk a whole bunch. And then sometimes God just has me in a prayer time where I just don't say anything. And I just sit in the stillness of the Lord. Jesus, we worship you. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for equipping us. Thank you for sending us, God. God, I just ask that you be with us. You're already going to be with us. God, I just ask that we recognize that you're with us, that, you want, that your desire is to walk closely with us, God. You know, that song is closer than the skin on my bones. That's how close you want to be with us, God. God, I just thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. God, and I thank you for your correction. God, that when you correct us, that we receive your correction. And we just, it's like a soldier, just we just enact it and immediately put it into action. But because we know it's what pleases you, God. God, help us to obey you. 
When you say go, we go. When you say speak, we speak. When you say listen, we listen. When you say don't look at that, we don't look at that. When you say don't listen to that, we don't listen to that, God. I always ask you, ask you to strengthen our inner man, God, to, to rearrange our priorities in our life. If we have put anything in front of you, God, Please show it to us so that we can remove it and put you in your right place, God. God, we give you all the rooms of our heart, God, leaving nothing, holding back nothing from you, God. You can only, you can only help what we give you. To the amount that you're hungry is the amount that you will be filled. So if you feel like you're lacking a touch of God in your life, Desire it. Put your faith on it. Attach to it. God, I need a touch from you. I remember when God became real to me, I couldn't do anything but say, you're so real. And if he hasn't been real to you, ask yourself why. Don't ask yourself. Ask him why he doesn't feel real to you. Because sometimes in this world, we have a hard time just separating and getting alone by ourselves because we don't even like ourselves. Oh God, I am who you say I am, God. And you crown me with confidence, God. Help me and give me the confidence to see myself rightly, God. Give us the confidence to see other people rightly, God. That's your son. That's your daughter. Like, what is my opinion? Like, I'm just thinking about if you have a bad opinion about somebody and, and it turns into goss gossip, God's like, God says, how dare you? That is my son in which you're speaking about. That's my daughter in whom you're talking about, God. I ask you to clean up our thoughts, clean up our words, God, and help remind us who we are and how to walk in your fullness, God. We worship you, Jesus. We love you. Amen.